Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to all those who are joining us here in the building and for everybody who's joining us online this Sunday. You're most welcome. Uh, this Sunday in the, uh, the uh, lectionary year pattern is Christ the King Sunday. So the, the prayers that I'm going to use this morning will reflect that it is Christ, the Sunday Christ the King. Jesus, this morning we hail you as our king, a king like, unlike any earthly ruler, a king who turns our ideas about power upside down. All hail King Jesus, the king who rides on a donkey, who kneels with towel around his waist and rolls up his sleeves. All hail King Jesus, the king who lives in ordinary neighborhoods, amidst the bustle of ordinary life. The king whose friends are fishermen and unconventional people. All hail King Jesus, the king who was homeless, was a homeless refugee. The king who was a carpenter and who knew the struggle and satisfaction of a hard day's work. All hail King Jesus, the king who didn't issue proclamations, but instead told stories that inspired and intrigued, daring to imagine a different kind of kingdom, one where the last come first. All hail King Jesus, the king who laid aside his power, the king who was betrayed by his friends, condemned by his religion, murdered by the state and even with his dying breath spoke the words of forgiveness and love jesus we pledge our allegiance to you and to your dream for this your earth amen chris in the band and now going to lead us in a time of worship Good morning, everybody. We'll get straight into it, I think. Uh, we'll sing When I Was Lost.
thanks everybody. Last, um, last week we had a reading from Micah, just to change the, uh, the tone a little bit of everything, um, which talked about nations, never shall they learn war anymore, but they shall sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Um, I don't know about you, but when I was hearing that last week, it gave me this sense of enormous peace and it sort of made me think about, well, what songs could we sing this week that are to do with that feeling of peace? And perhaps you've come to church this morning burdened with worries uh, for whatever reason, um, but we do have a hope in our Lord in that he will, he will provide for us. And the obvious choice for a song for that is, of course, the Lord's my shepherd. Be seated. Let's pray together. In the Psalms we hear the word of God. Be still and know that I am God. We are reminded the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. In the still moments, in the presence of God, we wait and listen for the word of God for us today. Living God, in the stillness of your presence, we know ourselves in new ways. 
we see more clearly where we have chosen the way of the world rather than the way of Christ. We have compromised when we should have stood firm and judged others by standards to which we rarely hold ourselves. We have been quick to anger and slow in love. We have not lived as people who know the kingdom of God is among them. Loving God, you have given us confidence to turn back to you as a forgiven people through the life and teaching, death and resurrection of your son Jesus. Like prodigal children, we are ready to begin again and like the loving parents in the story Jesus told, you are watching over us for our return, ready to take us into your arms and in the stillness of your presence. May we know ourselves in new ways as loved and accepted and forgiven. For Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God, we give thanks. We give thanks in whom we know you, you in your fullness as a loving and compassionate God as creator of all, as reconciler of the things which are afar apart, broken and ruptured. We thank you for your message of hope, your steadfast living out of all you stand for, for the Holy Spirit which draws us into new communities of compassion and healing. We thank you for human companionship, which builds up and restores the soul. We thank you for people around us who show us the way of the kingdom of God, for those who work, whose work is to provide us with all that we need. For those who care for us when we are sick and delight us in so many ways by being just who they are. We thank you for the random acts of kindness by strangers, which turns the ordinary into a moment of joy and meaning. We thank you for the blessing of the environment and for the sustenance for mind, body and soul, for color and beauty in nature and things we see and hear and feel, which bring us pleasure, make us stop for a moment and want to share and enjoy. Thank you, dear Lord, for all that you have given to us today, that we may bring glory to you. Amen. Young Church are going to be leaving us now, and may we pray God's blessing upon you as you go, and in everything that you will learn, we pray your, God's blessing on you this time. We're going to have now a reading from the book of Isaiah. Verses 1 to 6, the servant of the Lord. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. 
And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thanks be to God. As you know, over the last few weeks, we've been uh, looking at the Beatitudes and working through that. We've come to the the last of the Beatitudes uh, this Sunday, but we're going to read it together one more time. Uh, so we're going to read from Matthew chapter 5, verse, verses 13 to 10. And if you'd read the yellow type. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger for thir and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Alex is now going to come. Morning, everyone. Yeah, as Andrew uh, said, my name's Alex, and my opening question is, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? People, uh, in other words, what kind of person are you, and what kind of person do you want to be? People, uh, generally speaking, are not motivated in their behavior by what preachers tell them they should and shouldn't do, or by clever arguments. Uh, they're motivated in what they do by who they think they are, by that sense of the kind of person you are, the kind of group you belong to, um, the kind of person you want to be. And this is more powerful in determining how we live and what we do than all those clever arguments. So for us as a church, as we've uh, started in this last, I don't know, year, 15 months, meeting back together like this after the lockdown and the pandemic, in what really is a new kind of world, um, we've been asking ourselves, what is our mission? What is ours to do? And we've done that not so much by presenting programs or ideas for things we can do, but by focusing in on who are we? Who are we? What's our identity? Uh, what are our values? And so at the beginning of this year, we looked at the nine fruit of the Spirit, those characteristics that are listed in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Characteristics of Jesus in so many ways, that the Holy Spirit forms in the life of, of us as we follow Jesus. I wonder if you can still remember them. Uh, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There we go. And then since uh, the last few weeks, we've been looking at the sayings of Jesus, known as the Beatitudes from the Latin word for blessed, these sayings are all begin with, blessed are, for they shall. Sayings that he, that he used to open up his, uh, what we call the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7. And the values perhaps are not so obvious in these sayings, but in so many ways the, um, the Beatitudes 
show us attitudes for being. They do reveal values for us. Things like, for a little bit of translation, trust, lament, humility, justice, compassion, right motive, peacemaking, and courage. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds good? Does it sound good to you? Of course, this is not just about being a nice person. Uh, it's not just about your own well-being, although if you put these into practice, I think it will be good for your well-being and it will make you a nicer person. But this is Jesus presenting a vision of how the world will look when it's the way God wants it to be. It's Jesus presenting his vision of a world turned around so that those who are now last will be first and those who are now first will be last. What will the world be like when it's the way God wants it to be. And here are ways that you can put that world into practice. Uh, here is a practical path for following Jesus who is bringing that kingdom of heaven to earth. Trust, lament, humility, justice, compassion, right motive, peacemaking, courage. Would you like to be that kind of person? Would you like to be more like Jesus? The trouble is, it spells trouble. Because the way that the world is now suits a lot of people very nicely, thank you. They don't want the kingdom of heaven to come to earth. So when you practice the way of Jesus, you're quite likely to provoke opposition. Sometimes compassion and kindness and things like that can spark a compassionate and a kind response. But if kindness to someone who's suffering means challenging and disrupting the causes of their suffering, that rocks the boat of the way the world is and sparks opposition and trouble. You ask Martin Luther King. You ask Corrie and Betsy Ten Boom. You ask Oscar Romero and any number of other people who stood up and did what was right and suffered the consequences. But blessed, says Jesus, blessed are those who are persecuted for doing what is right, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For Jesus, doing what was right led him to a Roman cross on which he was nailed and executed. And his call to follow him is a call to walk that same path. It's the path to life. Don't forget, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But it goes through that valley of the shadow of death. So the question for us, I think, um, after that rather long introduction is, how do we find courage and resilience to walk the way of Jesus when the going gets tough. And I think we can look for hope and for answers to that by looking at what gave Jesus courage and resilience to walk his path. And I want to suggest three things. You're getting a good old-fashioned three-point sermon this morning, each of them beginning with K. How's that? Jesus uh, knew who he was, and Jesus knew why he was, and Jesus knew whose he was. So firstly, Jesus knew who he was. In Mark chapter 1, verse 11, we read how Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, before he'd really done any teaching or any miracles or anything, he was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the Holy Spirit coming on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And right through Jesus' life, we see in the Gospels how he constantly refers to God as Father. Even as he was hanging on that cross, he addresses God as Father. And I think that sustained him. And that sense of belonging to God, of, of who he was, being the Son of God, and that being loved by God was a rock 
and an anchor for him through the opposition and through the, the struggles that he went through. So he knew who he was and he knew why he was. In other words, he knew what his purpose was. He knew why he was doing what he did. In that reading from Isaiah, now that's the second of four servant songs in this middle section of Isaiah. And I think these were hugely important for Jesus, very significant on his understanding of his mission and why he had come and what he had to do. Uh, and in this one, towards the end, if you, if you can recall, uh, verse 5, the Lord says, uh, I, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Jesus understood that God's purpose was not just to do something good for Israel or for the Jews. God's purpose was to restore all things to the way they should be. God's purpose was for salvation, for liberation, for new life to come to all creation, to the ends of the earth. He understood that, that and he understood his calling to be the servant of the Lord, to serve that vision, to see in, the, in, in his life and in his mission that that meant he would have to go to the cross and break the power of death and its fear over us and bring new life as he rose from the grave. Jesus understood why he was here. He understood his purpose. And Jesus knew whose he was. If you read on in Isaiah 49... We come to these verses in verse 15, where God says, Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands, says God. Jesus knew whose he was. He would have been familiar with Isaiah 43, verse 1, that says, do not fear, for I am with you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And again, in a way, we come full circle with this one, back to knowing who you are. Uh, knowing whose, uh, he, Jesus knew whose he was. He knew he belonged to God. And that, again, was a rock and uh, an anchor that gave him courage and resilience for his mission. So what about you and me? What about Trinity? Well, let's, what is our mission? What is ours to do? Let's begin with, well, what do you care for? What, what do you care about? What's the thing that breaks your heart? What is God calling you to do in response to those concerns and that sense of, of, of compassion that God has put inside you? And what does the Bible say about it? And you might like to start with the Beatitudes as you think about, well, what does the Bible say about this thing I care about? So, for example, if it's human suffering, if it's those images of, of hungry children that you see on the news, for example, well, how about blessed are those uh, who mourn, for they will be comforted. As you feel that sadness, as you feel that, that pain, what will the world look like when those who mourn will be comforted? And so in any given situation, when your heart calls to you to act for those who are suffering, say the beatitude, say that saying of Jesus, and be encouraged. Because the saying invites you not only into solidarity with those who are mourning, but it also holds out the promise of salvation and new life. So when you're doing the right thing and it makes you feel weak at the knees at the prospect of it, remember what gave Jesus courage and resilience and be inspired to learn from him. So who are you? You are a beloved child of God. You are being transformed by the Holy Spirit into the likeness of Jesus. 
So what fruit of the Spirit are most needed for whatever is that sense of calling, that sense of purpose you have, for the action that you feel God is, taking, make, is calling you to take? Is it faithfulness? Is it patience? Is it kindness? Is it self-control? Pray for the Holy Spirit to let your identity in Christ bear fruit in the world. And then having prayed, go out and do it. Who are you? You're a beloved child of God. Why are you? What is your purpose? Jesus calls you and me and us all to be part of God bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. God is making all things new through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says to you, follow me. You might not want to. You might, and there might be a cost involved. But remember the promise in each of these sayings we've been looking at. Aligning your life with God's purpose for you will bring you peace and joy that outweighs and outlasts any cost that you might have to bear. There is glory to come that surpasses all that you have known so far. You may just need to take that first step Take your courage into your hands, what, even if it's only the size of a mustard seed. Take that first step and then realize that Jesus is alongside you and is always alongside you. And it's his work that he's inviting you to share in with him. And then whose are you? Just remind yourself, you are held in the loving arms of God and you are held in the love of the church as well. Your name is carved on Jesus' hands. As he, you know, Christ, Feast of Christ the King today, as Jesus in glory might look at his hands and see the scars of his suffering, see those nails. I think in a way it's not that he sees a nail scar, but perhaps your name. He remembers why he did it. And you are why he did it. I love that verse at the beginning of the letter to the Hebrews chapter 12 where the, the writer writing to church, a church that's going through, Christians going through a really tough time and being tempted to give up, he says, let's look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus saw you saved, set free, made new, made the way God wants you to be, restored as a child of God, and he says it was worth it all. Thank you. Your name is carved on the hands of God, and he, God says to you, you are mine, and I love you, and I'm pleased with you. So like Jesus, know who you are, know why you are, and know whose you are. Jesus calls us to follow him on this road to new life, for you, for me, for everyone, to the ends of the earth. He calls us to be part of this new world that is coming. So let's walk his way of trust with those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Walk his way of lament with those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let's walk his way of humility with the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Let's walk his way of justice with those who hunger and thirst for right to prevail, for they will be satisfied. Let's walk his way of compassion with those who are merciful, for they will receive mercy. Let's walk his way of right motive with those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. Let's walk his way of peacemaking with the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Let's walk his way of courage with those who are persecuted for, the, for doing what's right. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom of heaven when it comes to earth. This is what it looks like. I want to be part of it. How about you?
we're going to sing uh, him in response to that. The words may be new, but I believe, I hope, enough of us know the tune. And if you're not sure of the tune, join in when in second and third verse. But we're going to sing, Show Me How to Stand for Justice. Please be seated. Let's pray together. On this Christ the King Sunday, we remember that Christ's kingship does not shy away from the agony of the cross, the vulnerability of the incarnation, the risk and betrayal of human relationships in times of danger and threats. In our prayers for others, we are committing those we pray for into the hands of the one who knows the frailties and troubles of human life. And so we pray with compassion for those who hurt and fear and cry today because they have been let down by systems or circumstances or by the ones that they love. We remember those whose lives are most affected by climate change, who face hunger, thirst, fire or flood in the hearts of their homes. Grant wisdom and conviction to those who hold power to make a difference on a global, national, and in individual levels. We pray with love for those who are lonely or in pain and for those who care for family and friends in times of need. We acknowledge the stress of being a carer and the sometimes conflicting feelings of those who are cared for. 
bring comfort and encouragement, dear Lord, to situations of conflict and rest for those who bear the heaviest burdens. We pray with faith for those we love the most and those for who for who and for those who have no one to name them before you. May your presence surround and bless them today and always. May they know they are loved and known and seen by you. For those who grieve the loss of one they loved. And we pray especially that you will encourage them with strong memories and a confidence in your loving purpose which holds all souls in life. May we all take comfort from your words. Today, you will be with me in paradise. We give thanks for the witness of those who knew and followed you as their Lord and King and who showed us what it meant to be a Christian. May they know our grateful love for them now and always. We pray that you bless each one of us, filling us with your Holy Spirit, that you may reign as Lord and King in our hearts in this church in this community and in your world Amen we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Can we receive the offering, please? Heavenly Father, today we celebrate all the wonderful gifts that you have given to us. And in a moment, we will celebrate it in bread and wine. And in gratitude, we pray that you take these, our gifts, given in, in a variety of ways. Take our lives and use them to your glory. Amen. Before Alex comes and leads us in communion, we're going to sing a hymn. It's Lord Jesus Christ.
Please be seated. So this is the Lord's table, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I welcome you to come and to remember him by taking bread and wine and remember his body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed for us. That's the first thing to say, practically. You are welcome here, um, whether you've taken communion before or not. Whether you, um, If this feels like the appropriate thing for you to do in response to God's love for you, then please come and receive. The way we do it here, uh, for those of you who are visiting, in the gallery, the elements will be brought to you where you're sitting. Uh, those of you who are down in the body of the church, downstairs, will take you, I think, that side first, and just come up, and you can have the bread and then the wine, and just loop back to your seat. In the middle section, you'll be ushered up by the steward, come forward and come back the other way into your seat, and on this side again, loop round. Um, and feel free either to consume the bread and the wine at the front, or just linger over at the table there where you can put your empty glass, or take them back to your seat. And in each seat, there's a little um, place for you to put the, the glass when you've finished with it. So don't feel you need to be hurried. Um, just let's enjoy this and enjoy meeting with Jesus uh, around his table. Uh, the bread is gluten-free, the wine is alcohol-free, uh, if that's important to you. But you are welcome here today. Because as we gather at this table, we remember the unimaginable love of God, that Jesus was born of Mary, that he lived our common life on earth, that he suffered and died for us, and on the third day he rose again, and that he is in glory now, uh, praying for us. So in his presence and in the company of all the people of God, past, present, and yet to come, gathered here and scattered and gathering across the world, we celebrate the Supper of the Lord. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. And St. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth these familiar words. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And Paul adds, for as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let us pray. We give thanks to you, O God, that from the earth you cause the grain to come for the making of bread and that you cause the vine to yield fruit. We give thanks for everyone who helps to bring us your gifts, as you give us each day our daily bread. We praise you for Christ, the bread of life and true vine, whose, blood was whose body was broken for us and whose blood was poured out for us. At this, your table of grace, we proclaim his death and resurrection in a broken world. We proclaim the sacrifice of Christ, in a world of selfishness and greed. We proclaim the goodness of God in a world of hunger and injustice. We proclaim life in its fullness through Christ in a world of pollution and destruction. And we look in hope to the banquet of the kingdom of heaven, where the Lord scatters the proud in their conceit, casts down the mighty from their thrones, lifts up the lowly, and fills the hungry with good things. So by your Holy Spirit, bless us 
and these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread which we break may be a participation in the body of Christ, and the cup of blessing which we bless may be a participation in the blood of Christ. As we share the sufferings of Christ, so give us grace to know the power of his resurrection, that we may be made one and evermore abide in him to your praise and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus which was broken for you and his blood which was shed for you. Eat and drink on him in your hearts with thanksgiving. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your kindness in meeting with us here this morning, for your word around your table as we have gathered here in fellowship with one another in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you. And we pray that you will continue to walk with us as we seek to walk the way of Jesus in the days to come. Lord, may we live that life of your kingdom in the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that in our lives, in your church, and in all the world, your kingdom will come and you will be glorified to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. So our last hymn, or oh, before we sing the last hymn, I invite you to coffee afterwards in the Derwent Hall, which is directly behind me. So please do stay for that if you're able. But our last hymn is a hymn of pilgrimage, a hymn of hope. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. Let's stand to sing. So in the hope of that day, let us go into God's world to live and work to God's power and glory and the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we go, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with us and remain with us always. Amen. And let's bless each other in the words of the grace which are on the screen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.